My name's Nigel Jacket. I'm one of the wardens at the Broom Bird Observatory. I've been here for almost a year and a half now. The objectives of my work are to facilitate research on shorebird conservation, um, to provide interpretive tours to our guests, and to manage our on-site campground and accommodation units. So Roebuck Bay no, is... No, I'll, I'll just give you the nod. It's fine. Roebuck Bay is internationally recognised as a, an extremely important site for migratory shorebirds. Um, for over 30 years now, researchers have been coming here to, to study these birds, to figure out where they're going, um, why they're using the bay here, and if their populations are increasing or decreasing or stable. So, Australia is located within the East Asian Australasian Flyway which basically covers from Australia and New Zealand all the way up through Eastern Asia into Northeastern Russia and includes some birds um, that breed in far western Alaska. This map in particular here is for the bar-tailed godwit, which is a very common bird across Australia. Um, here you can see the migration path as it travels for six or seven days of non-stop flying into the Yellow Sea in Northeastern China. It'll then spend a couple of weeks there feeding up again before carrying on to the breeding grounds in far northeastern Siberia. They then will breed up there, spend a couple of months in that part of the world, um, raise a few chicks, and then they will return um, following a fairly similar route. Sometimes they'll travel longer distances or shorter distances, but they will use that Yellow Sea area again before then making another large leg down into northern Australia. Once they reach Northern Australia, they'll also continue across into Southern Australia, with some reaching as far as New Zealand. So here we have a diagram showing the different head and bill shapes of our shorebirds. And you can see that they all have very different shaped bills. Some have quite curved bills, some have straight bills, some have shorter bills, um, some don't even appear to penetrate the mud at all. But what all these different bill lengths achieve is that the same, uh, an individual of a species can walk across a mud flat. Using its shaped bill, it'll reach down and pluck out something at, at this depth, whereas something with a longer bill, such as the eastern curlew, can reach right down into the deepest burrows and extract prey, which the shorter beaked birds can't do. Small birds like the plover, which have large eyes and short bills, are visual feeders, and they just walk along the top of the surface of the mud, picking off little crabs and anything that they, worms that they can catch on the surface. So the reason that all these shorebirds congregate in Roebuck Bay is because there's 175 square kilometers of mudflat exposed at low tide. Within those mudflats are an incredible diversity of benthic invertebrates. Everything from bivalves and crustaceans um, to polychaetes and brachiopods. All of this diversity of benthic invertebrates allows many, many thousands of shorebirds to, to feed quite happily alongside one another. Since the studies began, uh, about 20 years ago, they've identified over 360 species of benthic invertebrate and more are being described by the day. Later this year, they'll be doing another 10 year expedition to to carry out further studies of these invertebrates and will in undoubtedly discover more species. So as, as I was saying before, our shorebirds um, make an incredibly long journey each year up to their northern breeding grounds where the chicks are born, and from there they'll move down to winter, the northern winter in Australia. Um, some of the threats that our shorebirds face along the way include disturbances on beaches and mudflats, particularly here in Broome, that's one of the, the major threats, is disturbance to the birds when they're roosting at high tide trying to get some rest. Um, as we go up through their flyway, we reach the Yellow Sea, which is one of their favourite foraging grounds because it's the world's largest intertidal mudflat. So all of our birds are sweeping up into the Yellow Sea and as we know um, there's a lot of development happening along along this coastline so the amount of available 
foraging habitat is being reduced by the day. So the birds are getting more and more concentrated and as a result they're getting less food into their bodies. From there they need to go up to their breeding grounds. So they want to be nice and fat and healthy so they can lay a few eggs and um, raise the chicks. Uh, some of the threats on the breeding grounds, there's not as many threats as there would be down here, but the major one in their breeding grounds will be climate change. As things warm, um, the ice will melt earlier, which might result in the insect hatch happening a lot earlier than when the birds arrive there. So the birds might arrive and there's a lot less food than what they were expecting. Also, as things warm, um, the vegetation, there'll be more trees growing and larger shrubs. The shorebirds like very open habitats. So as these trees and shrubs uh, progress in height, uh, there's less available breeding ground for them. So here we have a selection of shorebirds which Roebuck Bay is famous for. Um, we have two species of knot, the red knot and the great knot. Uh, both of them breed in, in the far up in the Arctic Circle, um, although the great knot can breed a little bit further south into sort of southeastern Russia. But they're very similar species, although in breeding plumage the red knot's very red on the underside, whereas the great knot's got lots of black little love hearts. Across here we have the ruddy turnstone, which is a very high Arctic breeder. Um, they've got a very funny triangular shaped bill which they use for flipping over seaweed and rocks and things like that, uh, which is where they got their name from, turnstone, and they feed on the invertebrates they can find underneath there. The redneck stint is our smallest migratory shorebird. It weighs about as much as a, a pack of matches, um, but they still make the incredible journey in their thousands from, from northern Russia down to Australia. Bar-tailed godwit is uh, renowned for having the longest documented non-stop flight. Uh, one was recorded flying from Alaska all the way to New Zealand in one flight. and I, It took about 11 days and was over 11,000 kilometres. The similar black-tailed godwit breeds in sort of northern China and Russia. Um, it's similar to the bar-tailed godwit but has a, a straighter bill and gets these nice tiger stripes in their breeding plumage. We have two species of sand plover in Australia, the greater and the lesser. Uh, the greater you can identify by its very large sort of chunky bill, whereas the smaller lesser is generally darker with a larger black patch under the eye and a much stubbier little bill. The Terex sandpiper is one of my favourites. Um, they're very fast and they run very low over the mudflats. They have a very funny little orange upswept bill which they sort of skim across the top chasing after their prey. The grey-tailed tattler is one which you often find on rocky shores sort of around headlands but in Roebuck Bay we get large numbers of them on our beaches. The wimbrel is one that you hear probably more often than you see. Uh, they have a very sort of fluty call, very loud and any time they get disturbed they make a lot of noise. And the eastern curlew is our largest shorebird. Um, they're declining very significantly. They're always the first shorebird to migrate back to their breeding grounds each year. So when we hear them flying over the observatory at night time, we know that migration has begun.